In Islamic philosophy especially, being which in Arabic is called wujud, plays a central role. Usually when you and I look at something, they say that table is there, that tree is in the garden. We don't think about it anymore. We think that a, we have a kind of big cake of existence within which there are different pieces and different places. However, if you look at more deeply, the way your mind can understand and analyze this experience of the world out there, you can ask two fundamental questions. One is, does that thing exist or does not exist? And the other is, what is it? And these two questions are very distinct because you can right now think of a pink cow in your mind and the answer to the question, what is it, you can answer. But if you say, is it, you have to say no because there are no external realities, it's only in your mind. Or vice versa, you can ask whether something is or not without really inquiring about what it is. Now, outside, they're wet together. You never find separate essence, separate existence. But within the philosophical mind, it's possible to separate one from the other. Does that distinction in Islamic philosophy help us to understand God or how God created the world more richly? Very much so. A thing in itself has no existential effect. It doesn't exist. For example, right now, you ask, what is grapefruit? What is aspirin? But that aspirin cannot cure your headache. And that grapefruit you cannot have for breakfast. There has to be this element of wujud that has to be added to the quiddity, to the mahiya, in order to existentiate it and enable it to have effect. Now, where does that come from? It doesn't come from the thing itself. And everything in the universe shares in this balanced equality between being or not being. That's called a possible being, a contingent being. Now, that's something which comes from the outside, then necessitates the existence of something. But everything is a contingent being. There's only one exception. Something whose very quiddity is being. So it could not not be. That is the most powerful proof of the existence of pure being, which is God. That is the heart of this argument, the ontological argument, that things of this world, what we consider to be objects, have no being of their own, but receive being from something other than what defines in our mind what they are, gives an opening into accepting the being from which the existence or lower being of everything comes. By distinguishing between the quiddity of something and existence which is added to that quiddity, you're already positing the reality, something outside of that, what we consider that object to be. It's whatness. This is the road that takes us to the realization of pure being whose character it is to emanate, to give of itself, like light, which is the character of light to illuminate. And so if you discover that there's some light in this room, you'll immediately say that that must have a source because this chair is not by its nature luminous. <laughs> so our intelligence, as soon as we say this chair is lit, is looking for the light which has lit, <laughs> lit this chair. And this is how being is seen in Islamic philosophy. So the very existence of you and I is proof that God is. Uh, in fact, the famous saying of Descartes, I think, therefore I am, cogito ergo sum, uh, was answered by a great metaphysician by saying he should have said, cogito or cogito ergo est, that is, I think, therefore God is. <laughs> At the very fact that we're thinking beings who think is proof of that pure being, which enables us to exist. <laughs> 